Okay, campers, rise and shine, because we are back to the Yu-Gi-Oh! grind. Back in November last year, I posted a video summarizing and reviewing each individual season arc of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters anime, and it blew up like crazy. Then I posted a review of the three Yu-Gi-Oh! movies, and they didn't blow up quite as much as the first one, but it got some pretty good views compared to what I'm normally seeing. And at the end of that video, I promised a review of the GX series. So, here we are now. Time to entertain you. So, the backstory behind the making of this series is that, uh, there isn't one. At least not one that I could find. The anime was finished up and Takahashi wasn't making any more stories for the manga. So, I guess Studio Gallup just decided to make a sequel show. And hey, in the words of Bo Burnham, But we'll stop beating this dead horse when it stops spitting out money. So, uh, on to the review. Now, before we get into anything else, I just want to preface again. This is a review of the English dub from 4Kids Media. If you don't like that, that's fine. There's probably an analysis of this series from the Japanese version somewhere out there for your enjoyment. And I sincerely hope you do find it, and I sincerely hope you do like that. But if you're going to be sticking around for this video, then please don't be complaining that this is the stupid baby version made for babies. Okay? Okay, so getting into the show now, I immediately love the fact that this show's soundtrack is so electric guitar driven. I love rock music, I love heavy metal, and I love how much this soundtrack is just filled with such fun sounding guitar noodles. <laughs> Within the first five seconds of this show, I'm already excited to fall in love. And then we're introduced to our main character, Jaden, who actually makes me fall in love even more. I like how Jaden Yuki, our main character, is immediately just a snarky little guy. It's not like in a Joss Whedon sort of way where he's making fun of every single aspect of the show he's in. He's just a little guy who likes to make jokes and make sarcastic remarks. Like how in his first scene, he's running late for his tryout to Duel Academy, and he quips that, At least since I'm not a student yet, they can't throw me in detention hall for being late. And that's another thing that's different in a fun way from the original series. There's basically a whole ass Hogwarts school for freaking duel monsters. Isn't that nuts? But that's another thing that I think makes Jaden more endearing. Once he's enrolled, as we'll see in the next episode, he's sent to the lowest ranking dorm, but he doesn't care. He likes red, he doesn't like homework, and he loves dueling. Who gives a shit about the dorms? But the thing that I think makes Jaden the most endearing is his hero worship of Yugi, who he accidentally bumps into on the way to his exam. At first he doesn't realize it's him, but right as he's realizing it's Yugi, Yugi offers Jaden a little something before leaving. Then Yugi walks away, and Jaden is a little flustered, but he promises to make Yugi. Hey, hey, you're... Why don't you take this? Something just tells me that it belongs with you. For real? Good luck. Uh, hey, wait! Thank you! I'll make you proud! <sighs> it's a nice little passing of the torch that I think they could have really screwed up the series if they did it wrong. If Yugi gave Jaden something like the Dark Magician, it would have been the biggest OH BULLSHIT moment. But instead, he gives him a Karibo variant. Not the most powerful card in the world, but Yugi's biggest wins were never overpowering his way to victory. It was more often the use of clever tactics and subversion. While they frequently compared Yugi to John Cena, I think a better comparison would actually be to Daniel Bryan. <laughs> Less so Brian Danielson in AEW and Ring of Honor, and more so late 2019 to mid 2021 Brian. Not the toughest guy in the world, but he knows exactly how to survive, how to overcome, and most importantly, how to win. Jaden, however, I would actually compare to maybe more of an Orange Cassidy. He may not care about much, but when he gets in the ring, you're gonna see how much of a threat this supposed slacker really is, especially if you mess with his best friends.
that's a nice way to go. If you can make a card with only 300 attack and 200 defense points work in your favor, then you might just be the next king of games after all. What's also great about this episode just as a pilot is the way it introduces all of the supporting characters. Bastion and Cyrus are friendly with Jaden, but have very different attitudes about dueling. Jaden loves to duel for the thrill of it, Bastion loves to duel but views it more as a science and something you just do for fun, and while Cyrus might love dueling, he's terrified of doing it in front of people, and in Generous is a pretty anxious little bugger, possibly in a clinical sense, but I don't think so personally, and Chaz is an elitist snob who looks down on everyone who isn't an upperclassman, Zane is a bit of an elitist but isn't nearly as snobby as Chaz, and Alexis seems to be Zane's best buddy, but is a far warmer personality, and is frequently complimentary of Jaden's strategies, and chastises Crowler from the stands, for going so hard on a kid who's just a rookie. And speaking of Dr. Crowler, he's probably the biggest snob of them all, openly looking down on students who don't meet whatever standards he has. He also probably wouldn't be allowed to teach in most states south of the Mason-Dixon line these days, judging by his fondness for presenting so femininely, poor guy, but he doesn't excuse being a holier-than-thou jerk. Anyway, as far as Jaden as a duelist goes, again, like Orange Cassidy, you will underestimate him at your own peril. Just when you think he's out of the game, he finds a way to surprise you. Oh, you've got a monster that deals piercing battle damage? Okay, I'll hang in for an extra turn with a monster that negates battle damage after it's destroyed. My turn again? Okay, I'm gonna bring out my ace monster and give him a little power up so I can wreck your monster. And then thanks to his special ability, that sucker's attack points are coming out of your life points. Game over, boss. For comparison, this was all only five turns. Yugi's first duel with Kaiba all the way back in the pilot for duel monsters was 22 turns. What a way to set up how cool your new protagonist is, right? The next King of Games is a pretty solid way to introduce everyone. It's quick, it's efficient, and most of all, it's fun. It's just so much fun. 7 out of 10. It's far from transcendent, but it's pretty darn entertaining. From there, it's pretty much just Harry Potter, but Yu-Gi-Oh! and without the transphobia. Jaden is Harry, Cyrus is Ron, Cyrus and Jaden's roommate Chumley is also Ron, Alexis is Hermione, if Hermione was a Slytherin. Chaz is Draco Malfoy. Bastion is Hermione, if Hermione was a boy in Hufflepuff or Ravenclaw. Dr. Crowler is Professor Snape, if Snape was a drag queen instead of an ex-wizard Nazi. And Duel Academy is just Hogwarts, but with one less house. Instead of Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin, it's Obelisk Blue, Raw Yellow, and Sniper Red. The first episode after the pilot is a bit of fun rivalry building with Jaden and Chaz having a duel on school grounds after hours and almost getting busted. The second is Cyrus getting himself in trouble by sneaking into the Obelisk Blue girls' dorm and needing to have Jaden bail him out by dueling Alexis. The third one after the pilot is Jaden squaring up with Chaz again, but on the books this time, and with some powered up decks from some brand new cards, courtesy of Crowler for Jazz, and a sweet old lady named Dorothy for Jaden. Together, these duels give Jaden a record of about three wins, zero losses, and one no contest. That's a pretty good karma to boot. The fifth and sixth episodes are a two-parter that gives some more depth to Alexis, but also unfortunately aren't really a about Alexis. We learned she had an older brother who went missing near an abandoned fourth dorm, and then when she goes to visit the place to pay her respects to him, she winds up getting kidnapped by a bounty hunter duelist hired by Crowler to scare Jaden off the island. Jaden and the gang save Alexis, and the bounty hunter who was posing as someone who can send people to the Shadow Realm winds up getting taken by the Shadow Realm. The actual Shadow Realm. So Alexis is safe. Yay! But Crowler caught Jaden dueling at the abandoned dorm after hours with Cyrus by his side. And now they're in danger of expulsion. Boo. Their salvation? A tag team duel against a pair of Crowler's choosing. So our boys are doing their best to train. But Cyrus isn't up to snuff thanks to his confidence problem, with Jaden pretty easily kicking his ass at every turn during their practice duels. And in the middle of all that, we finally get to know Zane, who it turns out is... Cyrus's older brother, and is actually the source of his little bro's confidence problems. And you know how Jaden is 5-0 after beating Cyrus? Well, Jaden decides to challenge Zane in order to give him a piece of his mind 
for constantly putting down his best friend. And Zane, the big man on campus, actually decides to humor the little guy before blasting him straight to hell in a match reminiscent of The Undertaker versus Jeff Hardy in that latter match for the WWE Championship on Raw back in 2002. But then in the middle of all of Jaden and Cyrus' problems, it turns out that Chumley's dad is also kind of an asshole. He wants him to come back and join his hot sauce business. Well, actually, it's a sake business, but uh, the dub won't let him say that. That is one thing I will give to you people who insist that the dubs are so much worse than the subs. That, that's just goofy. But the reason for this is because, well, Chumley kind of sucks at dueling. So Chumley faces off with his pops in a duel, with the winner deciding if Chumley stays or goes. And Chumley loses. Sadness. But it's okay because his dad sees what good friends he has in Jane and Cyrus, and sees how hard his little boy fought, and how well he played. And besides, Chumley can stay at school after all. Aww. After that brief interruption, it's back to Cyrus and Jaden, who now know they're facing... The freaking Paradox Brothers from season one of Yu-Gi-Oh? Well, it looks like even without the maze gimmick, they're still pretty darn tough. But then again, wasn't the maze gimmick just so much fun? Anyway, this is a really good duel for all parties involved. It's a great showcase for everyone. For starters, you remember the Gate Guardian, that tough SOB from when Yugi and Joey dueled these guys back in Duel's Kingdom? Yeah, he's back and they managed to bring him out in their third turn with no problems at all. And from then on, it's a pretty dominant showing until Jaden comes in clutch with his Spark Man Spark Blaster combo. Spark Blaster being a card which can switch any monster from attack mode to defense mode. And then Cyrus follows it up with his Drill Loit and his Shield Crush Magic Card, which allows him to destroy both the Gate Guardian and the other monster Para and Docs had on the field. But the brothers are undeterred. Para breaks out their Dark Element Magic Card in order to special summon his and Docs' second boss monster, the Dark Guardian, who has a whopping 3,800 attack and defense points. But these boys aren't ready to give up yet. Jaden drops his elemental hero Tempest and boosts him further with Skyscraper, making him and Dark Guardian even. The attack destroys neither monster, but it lets them survive for another turn. Dox then tries to smash Tempest again with the Dark Guardian, but Jaden manages to take the hit by using Tempest's special ability. He sacrifices one card on your side of the field, and your man gets to stay in the game for one more round. Now it's all up to Cyrus, and he does the one thing no one thought he could. He wins the fucking game. First, he sacrifices his Drill Loid to summon his UFO Roid, and then he uses Power Bond to fuse UFO Roid with Tempest to create UFO Roid Fighter. Yeah, it's a stupid name, but the effect sure as hell isn't. You see, UFO Roid Fighter's attack points are based on the monsters used to summon it in the first place. UFO Roid had 1200, and Tempest had 2800. So that's 4,000 to start with. And then Power Bond comes in with a nice little bonus. See, it doubles the original attack power of the monster it summoned. So UFO Roid goes from 4,000 to a whopping 8,000. Normally, there's a downside. When your turn ends, those original attack points are dealt back to you as damage. But there's not going to be any time to deal with that backlash when your 8,000-point monster just took down your opponent's 3,800-point monster and thus dealt those points a whopping 4,200 points of damage to their 3,500 life points. You're not going to need to worry about that downside because the game's already over. Check and mate. Mother fucker. And after all that fun, we finally get to know Bastion a bit more by giving him a friendly rivalry with Jaden and a not-so-friendly rivalry with Chaz, which culminates in a duel where Bastion whoops Chaz's ass with some very interesting chemical-themed monsters. This also starts an ongoing B-plot for Chaz. The condition of his and Bastion's duel was since Chaz lost to Jaden before, if he loses to Bastion today, he and Bastion will switch dorms. Chaz will get demoted to Raw Yellow, and Bastion will get promoted to Obelisk Blue. But at the end of the duel, when Bastion wins, he turns down the promotion, but Chaz still gets kicked out of his dorm. So the next episode, he decides, Well, screw Duel Academy anyway! I'm gonna find a new school to duel at! With Blackjack and Hookers! And the plots for the rest of that episode, and the one after that, 
are people just still wondering where the hell Chaz went. But in the midst of all that, we get a whole bunch of very weird episodes, starting with one where a literal monkey who's been enhanced with Kaiba Corp technology squares off with Jaden, then the monster spirit of Jinzo is summoned by some idiot's novelist Glue, and Jaden has to duel him to save their dumbasses, and then some douchebag tennis instructor from Obelisk Blue thinks Alexis is interested in Jaden, so he wants to prove that he's the only one for her by facing Jaden in a duel for her heart. They all lose because this series is all about the stat padding. And after that, we get a couple more wacky episodes, these time Halloween-themed, where Jaden has to face some loony who turned himself into Tarzan to get better at drawing cards, and a pair of students with the thing like Master Blaster from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome going on. And the last two are from Raw Yellow, so... Good god, the Slaver Reds may be bad students, but at least they're fucking normal teenagers. Good lord. Still, these episodes are a lot of fun. But after that weirdness, we get into some really cool stuff, where we get a two-parter with some kid named Dimitri who literally steals Yugi's deck and then pretends to be him, and Jaden has to duel him so that Dimitri will return the damn cards to the museum exhibit he stole them from in the first place. It's epic, and it's probably the closest thing that Yugi vs. Jaden will ever get to see. Or will we? From there, we get something about a second grader sneaking out of the island because she's crushing on Zane, followed by a two-parter where Bastion and Jaden finally square up, and it's pretty epic. You see, Bastion's whole gimmick is he's always trying to mathematically figure out how to beat his opponents. So he's been studying up on Jaden and figures out the very obvious conclusion on how to beat the guy. You take away his ability to fuse monsters. So six turns in, when Jaden tries to make elements of the hero Tempest, Bastion stops him dead in his tracks with the trap card. Cursed Seal of the Forbidden Spell, which negates the use of Jane's polymerization and renders him incapable of fusing any of his monsters. So, no Tempest, no Blind Wingman, no Rampart Blaster, no Thunder Giant, no Mudball Man, no nothing. So you might be thinking, Jaden is screwed, right? <laughs> Wrong! Because Jaden is a pit bull. He'll lock his jaws on whatever it is that he wants and he ain't letting go of that bitch. He uses every single trick in the book from his Bubble Blaster play to summoning his boss normal monster, the elemental hero Blade Edge, and he summons him in combination with his Skyscraper Field spell and a million other tricks until he finally pulls out the perfect combo to take down Bastion. He summons his elemental hero Wild Heart and equips him with his Cyclone Boomerang spell card, boosting him from 1500 attacks to 2000 points. Jane declares him an attack and it fails because Jane's monster has 3,000 attack points. So Jane loses 1,000 attack points in his monster and the spell card he equipped to his monster, meaning Bastion loses 500 life points due to the special effect of Cyclone Boomerang. And Bastion started this turn with 500 points, so 500 minus 500 equals zero. Checkmate, nerd boy. Oh, and this whole duel, it was a qualifying match. You see, a rival duel school called North Academy is sending in their best student to face off with someone from Duel Academy. Normally, their go-to would be Zane, but North Academy is picking a freshman. So in the interest of fairness, Duel Academy are doing the same. The top two freshmen are Bastion and Jaden, so whoever won got to face their challenger from the rival school. I wonder who that kid is. Well anyway, seeing as how this school's reputation is at stake with this duel, Jaden decides to actually do some prep for a change, but all his friends are being annoying as shit, so he decides to run off to be somewhere alone. And on the flip side, Crowler still can't just accept the fact that Jaden is a really fucking good duelist, even if he is a slacker. So he tries to find someone who can actually beat him, and introduce him to probably the strangest duelist yet, a full-on Big Lebowski parody named Little Belowski. And he also has the ability to lull people into a relaxed state while he duels, and it's really weird. I'm not mad at it, but fucking hell is it strange. Anyway, Jin kicks his ass like normal, so we have now brought him up to a combined record of 15 wins, one defeat, and one no contest. So, who's North Academy sending to face Jaden? Why, it's Chaz! And oh boy, you wanna talk about stat padding. Our boy Chaz was officially zero wins, two losses, and one no contest when he left Duel Academy. But then, in order to officially enroll at North Academy, he had to beat all 50 of this school's students in order to gain entry. Which he does officially bring his record up to 50 and 2 in the course of one episode. Of course, Chaz could have won a thousand matches, 
and it still wouldn't have changed that Mr. Princeton is to Duel Monsters what the Big Show is to pro wrestling. He's really good, but he ain't the main character. Wait, did I just imply that Jaden is John Cena now? Well, I'd still compare him to Orange, but against Chaz, yeah, he's Big Match John hoisting Paul White up onto his shoulders, and the big attitude adjustment in this case goes as follows. Chaz has his Arm Dragon level 7 up on the field with 2800 attack points. He's just blasted Jane's three Kid Hero tokens straight to hell. And that was just the mistake Jane was hoping for. He brings out his Ace in the Hole, the Flame Wingman then activates a trap, Miracle Kids, which states that for every Kid Hero token in the graveyard, Chaz's monster loses 400 attack points. 3 times 400 equals 1200, so the Arm Dragon drops down to 1600. One Skydive Scorcher later, Chaz is down by 500 points. Followed up with the Wingman special effect, and Chaz is gone from 2100 to 1600 to zero. Game over, man! The first 26 episodes of this series are a lot of fun. They're pretty low stakes for the most part, with the only real dire consequences of the heroes losing just being someone getting expelled, say for the Jinzu episode and I guess the monkey episode, but it's still really entertaining. Some duels are more fun than others, and I do kind of wish we saw more spotlight on other characters. In the first 25 episodes of the first Yu-Gi-Oh! series, there were only 14 episodes that were focused on Yugi dueling. Well, Joey had six, and then they had a tag duel that took up three episodes, giving them a total of 17 and nine. Jaden has been the sole focus on the protagonist side for about 20 episodes. The other six being an episode focusing on Jaden and Cyrus practicing, so they're sharing the focus. Then you get Chumley's duel with his father. Then the two-parter about Jaden and Cyrus's tag team duel, Bastion's duel against Chaz, and Chaz's duel against the North Academy student. Sheesh. Maybe Jaden really is GX's John Cena with how much they're prioritizing him to the detriment of everyone else. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, I like Jaden a lot, but even as a fan, I would really like to see more of what everyone else has going for them. The original Yu-Gi-Oh! show really took their time with building up how dire things were and letting the threats feel like threats. Whereas in GX, every time you think someone's got Jaden on the ropes, he manages to pull a win out of his ass before the credits can roll. But then again, given what we're about to see in the next arc, I suppose you can argue that it's the reverse of the Duelist Kingdom arc, followed by a whole bunch of nonsense in Domino City. It's letting you enjoy the magic of Hogwarts before Voldemort comes back. It's letting you enjoy all the fun of Hulkamania before the Undertaker arrives. Or before the steroid scandal happened. So in the end, I'm going to give all this school life filler a 7.5 out of 10. Again, far from transcendent, but a damn good time. If you have a day off from work or school or whatever your obligations are, you can't go wrong with killing time by enjoying this or a bowl of cereal with a piece of toast and a glass of orange juice. And now we enter the first part of a really big arc that gets pretty epic. Sort of. These next few episodes are unfortunately a kind of prequel to the main arc. Jaden, Cyrus, Chumley, and Alexis are taken out on a field trip by their teacher, Professor Banner, where they're supposed to be checking out some ancient ruins on the island, but end up going back in time to ancient Egypt to fight an actual shadow game against a man called the Shadow Keeper. This might as well happen. Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. This is already so goddamn weird. I'm not the biggest fan of this duel, but the finish is pretty great, with Jaden using the special effect of his Elemental Hero Necro Shade, that being... If Necroshade is in the graveyard, the owner can summon a high-level monster without a sacrifice, so he uses it to bring out his elemental hero, Blade Edge. One shot from Blade Edge and his 2600 points to the opponent's Gravekeeper's Curse, and it's game over. As a token of goodwill from the Gravekeeper, however, Jane is given half of a medallion that will protect him should he ever find himself in a shadow game again. Which is surprisingly pretty soon when we're introduced to our arc villain's first lieutenant, Night Shroud who interestingly has the other half of the medallion that Jaden was just given. This obviously begs the question, what does this arc villain even want? Well, as the headmaster of Duel Academy, Chancellor Shepard explains, the school is built in part to protect the sacred beast cards, counterparts to the Egyptian guard cards. Why do they need to be protected? Well, because if they're ever used, they will pretty much cause the literal end of the fucking world. Not in the way that the gods could be dangerous in the wrong hands. No, they're dangerous in the way that if anyone uses them, 
It's Goodbye Earth. These cards are kept hidden behind a mystical vault that is locked with something called the Spirit Gates, and each gate has an individual key. Given what's coming now, Shepard is entrusting these keys with seven of the best duelists on Academy Island, those being Dr. Crowler, Professor Banner, Jaden, Alexis, Zane, Chaz, and Bastion. All seven of these cats are going to have to face an opponent from the Shadow Riders, another group of seven duelists intent on taking those keys and unlocking the spirit gates to take hold of the sacred beasts. Round one, Jin versus Nitro. As it go, I mean, Jin wins like normal, but this is a rough one. It's another one of those shadow games, and this time it takes place inside of a goddamn volcano. And worse yet, this asshole kidnapped Chumley and Cyrus. Even for a guy who loves a ghoul duel, this isn't fun. Jane still pulls off the win, though, by using another perfect combo. He fuses Wild Heart with Blade Edge to form elemental hero Wild Edge, who has the unique ability to attack every monster on the opponent's side of the field in the same turn. Ordinarily, this would be pretty great, except for the fact that Night Shroud has his boss monster out, the Red-Eyes Darkness Dragon, who starts at 2400 attack points, but gains an extra 300 for every dragon in the graveyard, boosting his attack power to a whopping 4500. But Jane has just the tools to or mount that obstacle, however. His Wild Half Spell card, which halves a monster's original attack points by summoning an exact copy of it. So that drops the Darkness Dragon from 4,500 to 3,300. Still not good for the 2,600 Wild Edge until Jaden pulls out his Trump card. The same one that earned him victory against Crowler back in Episode 1. Skyscraper. One 1,000 point boost for Wild Edge, and he's destroyed both Red Eyes Tokens and Night Shroud's Spear Dragon causing Night Shroud to go from 1200 to 900 to 600 to zero. And that's the end of the game. But not quite the end of the episode. The condition of this duel was not only that Jaden would lose his spirit key if he lost the duel, but seeing as this was a shadow game, the loser also lost their soul. But here's the twist. Night Shroud wasn't the only one inside this man's body. So while his soul was taken, someone else got to stick around after the fact. And that someone was none other than Alexis's long-lost brother, Atticus. After all that craziness, though, it's time. Ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished fellows of the non-binary persuasion, please welcome the one and only Camilla, the vampire queen and the first real villainess of the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX anime. Where everyone else was kind of a jerk, or if they were truly malevolent and only lasted for an episode or two, this chick stays with us for three whole episodes, which isn't a lot, but keep in mind, she dueled a different opponent for every single one of these episodes, and ended her run going 2-1. and one. Everyone else almost walked away going 0-1, oh so this is actually quite impressive. And what makes her so deadly? Well, she has this unique and almost foolproof strategy known as... Cheating! She has these little vampire bats that she can psychically communicate with. They slip into everyone's dorm room and look at their cards as students and staff are formulating what strategy they want to approach with, and the, the bats fly away back to Camula and relay back what they saw. So who's up first on the chopping block? Why none other than Dr. Bellion Crowler. And while he does get slaughtered pretty easily as you might expect, he still acquits himself pretty well. It shows some unexpected depth of character. Throughout the episode, it's pretty clear that Camula's real target is Zane, and she repeatedly offers to let him fill in for Crowler. But Crowler not only takes offense that he isn't being taken seriously, he viscerally refuses to let any of his students be hurt by this evil bitch. There's even a bit where Jaden runs in and hypes up Crowler as a great duelist, and Crowler gets back to his feet and hollers out Jaden's catchphrases. You see how it makes me slightly ill to admit it? Jaden is absolutely right! I can beat you! I can throw down and I can get my game on! Blah, I suddenly feel the need to rinse my mouth out! Then brings out his ancient gear golem and blasts away 2,000 of Camilla's light points before applying heavy storm to wipe out all of her trap and spell cards. It's a great move, but it sadly isn't enough. Camilla then special summons her vampire lord and then sacrifices him to summon vampire Genesis, who starts with 3,000 attack points but gets a 200 point boost thanks to Camilla's other monster, Vampire Bat. Vampire Genesis destroys Crowler's Golem, knocking Crowler down from 1700 to 1500 life points. Camilla then issues a second attack with her third monster, Zombie Werewolf, knocking the good doctor down to 100 life points. Then the vamp delivers the coup de grace with her Vampire Bat, and to his credit, Crowler doesn't show a lick of fear in his final moments and calls on Jaden specifically to come 
come back and kick this evil bitch's ass before being gobbled up by the Shadow Realm. My students, no matter what happens to me, always remember this. It's true, I may have been hard on you at times, but it's simply because I believe in you. Therefore, if I fall here, there's still hope, because I know you all will rise. Have you finished your final lesson yet, Crowler? Excuse me, but that's doctor to you! Ha 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 ha! If you wish, I'll put it on your tombstone as soon as I'm finished! That all? I thought that you Shadow Riders were supposed to be tough! Jaden, avenge me, my boy! Alas, that's not quite what happens. Instead, Zayden goes up to bat next, and he systematically dismantles Camula, move by move, until a final plank where Camula pulls another dirty trick. Zane can either beat her and let Cyrus lose his soul, or he can surrender and lose his own soul along with his spirit key. It's an especially well done scene where Cyrus pleads with Zane to go ahead and let him be taken, because he sucks anyway, and he's not worth risking the safety of the entire world for. And for a moment, it seems like Zane will go through with it. But in an especially touching moment, Zane chooses to throw the duel and let himself be taken away. And this is where Atticus's half of Jaden's amulet finally comes in. You see, Camilla's shadow magic works because she wears an enchanted necklace. But when the two halves of Jaden's amulet combine, Camilla's magic is nullified. Well, sort of. There's a little more to the magic. Camilla was going to take Cyrus's soul specifically by using the magic of a card called Illusion Gate. The in-game effect is that all monsters are destroyed when it's played, and that it brings back the opponent's monster on the summoner side of the field. The cost is the soul of the player choosing that will be taken if the player loses. When Camilla can't pick a soul from Jaden's friends, she simply chooses to gamble with her own soul instead, which turns out to be a mistake because she not only loses the duel and her soul, but her demise means the end of vampires as a species because according to Camilla, she was the last of her kind. A damn shame, but perhaps she shouldn't have put up such a gamble. The first part of the Shadow Riders arc is an excellent change of pace. I don't particularly like the Gravekeeper two-parter, but the episodes with Camilla and Night Shroud are really great stuff. The Camilla three-parter is especially great, just tripping with atmosphere. The shadows, the black and white intro for our vampire lady, and the amazing motif they have for her whenever she's on screen. Shroud doesn't make an especially strong impression, but he definitely does a great job at making you realize just how real this shit is now. He's not an affably evil type villain who will make pleasant conversations with you while destroying everything you love. He's here to burn you and make you suffer. And boy does he ever. Inferno Fire Blast! <laughs> That hurt! Inferno Fire Blast! Don't get ahead of yourself! Attack! Inferno Dark Fire! Ah! It's your move! If you have any strength left to make it. Jaden! A minor bit of disclosure here, I actually re-watched this whole series for the first time in a few years, just after finishing the original Yu-Gi-Oh! video, and I'm re-watching it again to make this video. And what I like about Night Shroud is how you can still see a bit of Atticus still in him. As we go through the series, you'll find that Atticus is a bit of an oddball with a pretty annoying sense of humor, and watching back this duel with Jaden as Night Shroud, I appreciate that there's still a bit of the oddball with an annoying sense of humor, but it's just tinged with a bit of sadism now. Oh, because evil. It's a nice touch by the writers. After all of that, we get a short break from the Shadow Riders arc with an episode of Jaden processing just what he's been going through the past few weeks, and he's starting to not enjoy dueling anymore because it isn't fun anymore. Because right now it always means someone's life is on the line. Either his or someone else's. Hearing all of this though, the spirit of Wing Kurio takes Jaden and friends down to a, a 
Marvel Duel Monsters, where Kaiba Man, a monster created by and based on Seto Kaiba himself, challenges Jaden to a duel to show that you can still lose a duel and be perfectly safe and sound. Just because there's high stakes when dealing with Shadow Riders, that doesn't mean you can't just cut loose and have fun whenever you're not up against them. Which is a pretty good moral, and a great way to just decompress for a minute after a batch of seven really intense episodes. All in, I'm going to give this first Shadow Riders arc an 8 out of 10. Now we take a proper break from the Shadow Riders with a thread from the school duel two-parter, Chaz's brothers, Jagger and Slade Princeton. You see, during the school duel, we got to know a bit about Chaz's family, and it turns out there's a bit of a pact going on between the Princeton brothers. The eldest will conquer the world of politics, the middle will conquer business and finance, and Chaz, the youngest of the three, shall conquer the world of duel monsters. They gifted Chaz with a glorious briefcase full of the rarest duel monsters cards money could buy, and Chaz? didn't use a single fucking one of them because he wanted to make it on his own. And now, the elder Princeton brothers want to get even with their baby brother for making an embarrassment of them by losing in front of the whole world because they put his and Jaden's duel on live television. They plan to buy the academy from Kaiba, but Kaiba says he'll only agree to their terms on the condition that they beat one of their students. So the brothers decide to challenge Chaz, but there's an extra stipulation on top of it. Chaz can only duel using monsters with only 500 attack points or less, while Slade, the brother that will be challenging Chaz, will be using all of the ultra-rare and insanely powerful cards they are going to have Chaz use at the school duel. Chaz insists that he can't do it because the only monster he has with those kind of stats is Ojama Yellow. However, Professor Banner mentions that there's an old legend about a well in the wilderness of Academy Island that students would throw away their weakest monsters to. So Jane and Chaz go searching and son of a gun, it's actually real. What do you know? So Chaz accepts his older brother's challenge and he kicks his ass. It is honestly a more impressive beat than the blatant stat padding that was Chaz's gauntlet against the entire North Academy student body. Instead of beating 50 jabronis, 44 of which he beat off screen, he beats one jabroni with a deck of insanely powerful cards, and he does it all with a shitload of one-star monsters. Bad ass. 8 out of 10 episode. I wouldn't mind it being a two-parter, honestly. We return to the Shadow Riders arc with a batch of some really fucking awful episodes and an especially horrific character derailment for Bastion. We start this off with a two-parter where everyone's favorite whiz kid from Raw Yellow faces off with an Amazon warrior Shadow Rider named Taya. It ends with Bastion getting his ass beat because Tanya keeps flirting with him and he keeps getting all flustered. And then Jane comes in to beat her in the next episode which features a lot less flirting and a lot more punching, basically making it like Joey's duel with Valen from season four of the original show. You know, I'm not even against flirting as a tactic in general, but it really bugs me that it actually works for Bastion. I get the idea. It's a friendly reminder that these characters are all teenagers who can't regulate their emo. Oh my God, they're teenagers. Tanya is a grown ass woman. They're teenagers and Tanya, Tanya's a grown ass woman. FBI, open up! Uh, anyway, bizarre implications aside, I get the idea of this plot. Bastion is a man of logic. It makes sense that he doesn't feel comfortable with someone playing with his emotions. It's not the plot itself that bugs me, it's the fact that after this, Bastion kind of became a joke character. And this isn't something that was just limited to the dub either, because you can tell structurally, they gave up on him in Japan too. Going forward, Neither version of the show took Bastion very seriously. But hey, that's not this episode's fault. Though you could maybe say it's the next episode's. Because the next episode is Jaden and Tanya's duel. And the whole premise is Jaden wants to duel Tanya to help Bastion get his confidence back. Somehow. And then Tanya ends up falling for Jaden. Who is also a teenager. Uh. You know, on a personal note, I have a big thing for muscular women, and I think Tanya has an amazing design, but good lord, do I fucking hate her character in this story arc. 4 out of 10. Just why? Why, God, why? 
And then we take a journey back into the Sea of Irrelevant side plots with an episode about the pirate captain of a submarine who wants Chin's help to start his own dual school. God, this show is so weird. And to make it worse, the episode starts with Jaden mad at Cyrus because he sold Cyrus's bed for a rare card. You know, Jaden isn't exactly book smart, and he can be pretty oblivious, but he's not so stupid that he would think a bed is a fair trade for one stinking card. And he's not a big enough jerk to make that trade for his best friend's bed. 5 out of 10. Not as bad as the two-parter with Tanya, but... Jesus. This was a new level of stupid for the show. Oh boy. Oh my goodness. Ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished non-binary individuals, we have a special guest for this next installment of the Shadow Riders arc. Everyone, please help me welcome the one and only Darren Dunstan as Academy Award winner Christopher Walken as Don Zalug. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Detective Zalug. Oh my, that's exactly what I was afraid of. You may think that's where it's safest, but it's not. For you see, all the Shadow Duelists have to do is find you and they found the key. <sighs> Well, I suppose we can go to sleep soundly now. Yes, quite soundly. Now, children, get to bed. You all must be exhausted. First, I play Pot of Greed. It lets me draw two more cards from my deck. You know, for whatever reason, whenever I think about this episode, I just seem to think it's really stupid, but it's actually a pretty nice change of pace with a fun gimmick. You've got a group of five criminals who call themselves the Dark Scorpions, the main one being Don Zalou. And Don has an interesting deck. The cards are just him and his friends, and it's not a case of the holograms all look like Don and his buddies. They literally are Don and his buddies. He opens the duel by playing a face down spell or, or trap, and then summons the monster Don Zalou. And instead of just magically dematerializing from behind the giant floating card, hovering over the ground, and then rematerializing in front of it, he literally just walks around it. We also get to see Chaz's new deck that has all of the weak monsters from his duel with his brother, and his armed dragon cards from the school duel two parter. I dig it, and I especially like how, before we get into the actual duel, we see a mini detective story happen where the Dark Scorpions steal the remaining spirit keys and Chaz tries to find out what happened before revealing that he had the monster spirits of his low-level cards watching everyone's keys and they all saw the Dark Scorpions steal them. The actual duel? Eh, it's nothing to write home about, but it's a fun way to kill 15 minutes. And then we get into some more ancient Egyptian wank, which answers the question you likely never asked. What if Atem was kind of a whiny asshole who wasn't that good? Well, then you'd get Abydos III, another ancient pharaoh who boasts having an undefeated record, which he only has because his servants always let him win whenever they dueled. Jin, of course, beats his ass, leading to Abydos starting to crush on him and offering to take him back in time to Egypt, but Jaden politely turns him down while still offering to remain friends. Jaden later decides to brag a bit about the fact that he wound up defeating an undefeated legend. Jaden the Legend Slayer! I like the sound of that! Uh, I think you mean Legend Killer. I have voices in my head, they count for me, they understand, they talk to me. close out this section of the Shadow Riders arc with a little sequel to the big Shadow Duelist two-parter from all the way the fuck back in episodes 5 and 6. Except that faker ain't faking shit this time. Remember earlier when I said he got taken by the Shadow Realm? Well now that he's back, he's got some fancy new shadow powers and he's back to picking on Alexis. But this time, he wants to duel her, not Jaden. If he beats her, it's the usual stakes. One soul and one spirit key to go, please. And if she beats him, Atticus's memories will be restored. Everything he was before he was Night Shroud, everything during that time, and everything now. And beat him she does. Good for her. 
very good for her. In fact, we haven't seen Alexis duel in 38 freaking episodes. But then the episode ends with a pretty epic bombshell. You see, ever since the beginning of the Gravekeeper 2-parter, Professor Banner has been acting pretty sus. And then when Atticus is fully recovered, he remembers that when he was overtaken by the Shadows and became Night Shroud, he was called to the abandoned dorm to take a test by none other than Professor Banner. Leading the cast and the audience to realize... Professor Banner is a Shadow Rider. Part 3 of this arc isn't my favorite, but it's still really fun. It's a big step down from how great this arc started with Camilla and Atticus, but it's a big step up from that fucking two-parter with Tanya. I like that we're seeing a little less Jaden focus for this part. I love Jaden, but I'm getting a little bit sick of him. I'm sick of him being the center of attention all the time. In the original series, you saw a bit more of an even divide between Yugi and Joey. Yugi was obviously the main character, so it was more of a 60-40 split, but this is more of a 90-10 split, which is why it's refreshing to see Chaz and Alexis kick some ass for a change during this time around. Though I do wish Alexis's duel was a two-parter. In fact, I wouldn't have minded making the Shadow Duelist's first duel a single episode duel and then making his return the two-parter just to show how much more dangerous he is now now the dark scorpions oh absolutely perfect no notes no notes at all seven out of ten time for the next filler so for whatever reason instead of immediately following up on that bombshell we instead do an episode where everyone dresses up as duel monsters for spirit day at duel academy and then the spirit of the actual dark magician girl shows up to have a bit of fun she faces off with Jaden and loses in the fifth round and i will say i don't normally care for short duels but i think there were some clever strategies used here you see, Dark Magician Girl had two copies of the Magician's Valkyria and one copy of herself on the field. And the special effect of the Magician's Valkyria is that whenever she's on the field, you can't target any other spell cost or monsters besides her. But with two on the field, you're stuck in a loop. You can't attack one because the other forces you to attack them. But you can't attack the second one because the first one demands you attack them. So Jaden just ends his turn. So DMG boosts the card version of herself with the spell card magic formula and declares an attack, which activates Jaden's traps. DMG's supercharged DMG targets the flame wingman for an attack, a hero barrier blocks it. And Jaden's second trap, Staunch Defender, activates, forcing the two Valkyrias to attack the flame wingman. So, two 1600 point monsters versus one 2100 point monster. Well, that ends poorly for DMG, who drops a thousand points and then takes the L thanks to Wingman's special effect. Ouch. The Dark Magician Girl episode is pretty fun, but this seems like something that belonged after the Shadow Riders arc, or at least a little further back than right here. It should not have been immediately after the Dr. Banner reveal. 6.5 out of 10, though. But the writers still won't stop with the damn filler. Because now we have some stupid shit with a card shark named Pierre who wants to pick a fight with Alexis. You know, I realize I was just saying that I wanted to see a spotlight on more of the supporting cast in this show, but this isn't really what I had in mind. Anyway, this jerk used to know Alexis back in grade school. He would always challenge people to duels where he would have them ante up their most valued possession. Alexis didn't take kindly to this, so she challenged him. If he won, he'd get the scarf Alexis's mother made her, and if she won, he'd give everyone their stuff back. Alexis won, and then this asshole stole her scarf and ran away like a coward. And now he's back to get his win back, only instead he winds up going 0-2 against her. And Alexis gets her scarf back. Aw. Then the guy explains he's actually in love with her. I'm sorry. The only reason I wanted to duel was because I loved you. I thought, if I won, that maybe you would fall in love with me, Alexis. And yeah, okay. Spare me, you French Vinnie Vegas. 5.5 out of 10. It is not awful, but you can easily skip it. And now we return to the story of Professor Banner who's been MIA since Alexis' duel with the Shadow Duelist. But he finally returns as his Shadow Rider persona, Amnail. And he's pretty bad news considering in just one episode, he defeated Atticus, Alexis, and Chaz, claimed their souls, and then unlocked three of the last four spirit gates. And now it's all up to Jaden like usual. And the build-up of this duel is incredible. It's incredibly mysterious and it really builds up the tension and makes you wonder what's going to happen next. And the actual duel is pretty great too, with Banner using a really interesting alchemy-based deck and having the unique strategy of... 
straight up gaslighting a teenage boy by telling him every duel he's ever won at the academy was fixed. I questioned this at first, but then I realized this was a duel with a lot going on for Jaden. Banner was his favorite teacher and the overseer of his dorm. He looked up to the guy, and here he was now, turning out to be this evil son of a bitch. Jaden's whole world got turned upside down as is, and now he's telling him that his duels were fixed? And on top of all that, he's what, 15? Of course he's gonna buy it when an adult he used to admire tells him something so blatantly false. Even so, Jaden perseveres and finds a way to rise above hate and never give up. You see, during this whole duel, Banner's been using a deck where his monsters aren't sent to the graveyard, they're just removed from play. Which is great, because his current monster, Helios Trice Majestus, gains 300 attack points for every one of Banner's banished monsters thanks to its special effect, giving him a whopping total of 3900 points. But Jaden comes in clutch with his final draw, Miracle Fusion, a card which can fuse monsters currently in the user's graveyard. So Jaden uses Bubble Man, Avian, Clay Man, and Burstintrix to form Elemental Hero Electrum, whose special ability sends banished monsters back into the deck. So Helios Trice Majestus drops from 3900 points to a big fat zero. So then, Electrum blasts Helios away and drops Banner's life points from 1200 to also a big bat zero. And after this, Banner comes clean that he was lying through his teeth and Jaden really is that good. He also returns all six of the other spirit keys and explains that he didn't join the Shadow Riders out of a hunger for power. He was a double agent who wanted to duke it out with Jaden to prepare him for the real menace to come, the one who leads the Shadow Riders. After this, with it having been revealed that Banner was an actual alchemist who created a second body for his soul to live in, Banner gives Jayden his journal and then collapses into dust, having used up both of his worldly vessels. The only real note I'd offer at this point is the fact that it seemed like everyone knew that Shadow Rider number 7 was actually Banner after Alexis's duel with the Shadow Duelist, but the fact that Banner is Amnail is treated like a big reveal. It almost comes off like the writers forgot the reveal they did back in episode 41. But anyway, moving on to actually another Alexis duel, this time You're facing beautiful. another weirdo with a crush on her. You're the weirdo in question is Chaz Princeton. Never had a yeah, date. it's gonna be a rough one. You see, that during you their time in the Shadow Realm, Chaz apparently imagined Alexis confessing her love for him, and now he can't get it out of his head. And Atticus decides to be a dumbass and encourages Chaz to pursue her, so he gambles with all seven spirit keys. In case you were wondering, this was the idiocy part in Alchemy, Idiocy, and the Sacred Beasts. To be fair though, this is a pretty great duel, with Chaz using a lot of romantic themed cards for the duel, and opening with an especially clever play. See, he opens with Ojama Yellow and two face down cards, and then plays a spell card which allows Alexis to take control of either monster he controls or a face down card. Alexis chooses one of Chaz's face down cards, then Chaz plays Giant True Nade to send all face down cards back to their owner's hands. Then, since the card Alexis picked was Hidden Wish, its effect activates, shaving off a thousand life points from Alexis and adding a thousand points to Chaz. In the end though, Alexis triumphs by summoning her cyber angel Benton and using her to pummel Chaz's Ojama King. An actually pretty great duel, though it is soured a bit by Alexis offering to stay friends with Chaz after he literally said he doesn't care if Alexis doesn't want him. If she loses, she still has to go on a date with him either way. Listen, wanna know who I love? I am in love with dueling. Yeah, so what? Huh? Don't forget, if I win this, you'll still be mine! Dude, it's over. I'll date you, boys! We make a cute couple! If you won't love me, then I'll defeat you, and you'll have to go out with me. That's some incel shit right there. But in the end, the keys never truly mattered, because as soon as Chaz and Lexus's duel is over, they were summoned to the lock 
for the spirit gates. The main cast then run after them, but are greeted by the arrival of one Kagemaru, the leader of the Shadow Riders, and none other than the superintendent of Duel Academy, who explains what the real way to unlock the cards was. Dueling energy. The more of it you expend, the weaker the gates would become until they finally burst open and there was no one on the island with more dueling energy and fighting spirit than the pride of the Sliper Red Dorm, Jaden Yuki. And in true Bond villain fashion, Kagemaru offers the gang a fighting chance at stopping him. You see, now that the sacred beasts are free, he needs to perform a ritual to awaken them. And the ritual works by, what else, and the duel monsters. And since we already established the fact that Jaden is the energizer bunny of dueling energy, Kagemaru demands that the Sliper Slacker be the one to face him or he'll drown the entire island. And with stakes like that, Jaden goes for it. And after 19 episodes of buildup, well, Kagemaru isn't making anyone wait to see what the big deal is when it comes to the sacred beasts, because he summons them right away, inside its first turn. Jaden opens with his mirror gate face down and Burstinatrix in defense mode, and then Kagemaru responds by playing three face down cards, which he openly announces are traps, and then sacrifices all three of them to bring out Uriah, Lord of Searing Flames, who immediately destroys Jane's trap card and blasts Burstinatrix straight to hell. Not a bad start for Season one's Big Bad. Jane's spooked, but he won't give up that easily. He digs in his heels in and brings out Tempest, and pairs him up with Skyscraper to blow away Uriah with one shot. Maybe these sacred beasts aren't so tough after all. Only then, Kagemaru pulls a Mark Henry on Jaden. <laughs> You see, when Uriah is destroyed in battle, his special ability allows its owner to just discard one trap card to bring him back to the field. And since Uriah's attack points are determined by the number of traps in their owner's graveyard, Uriah comes back even stronger. But Jaden decides to play the odds and sends an additional card to the graveyard to let Tempest stick around after Uriah blasts him away. Then he equips Heated Heart to Tempest to pump up his usual 2800 to 3300 and then up to 4300 when he attacks Uriah thanks to the effect of Skyscraper. Kagemaru, in turn, just throws away another trap card to bring back Uriah again, and then plays a field spell of his own called Fallen Paradise, which not only destroys Skyscraper, but it also means Kagemaru can draw three cards per turn if he has a Sacred Beast in play. And since he does, he throws down three spell cards, which he then sacrifices to summon Haman, Lord of Striking Thunder. But like I said back when Jaden dueled Bastion, this kid is a pit bull. When he locks his jaws on a match, he won't let go for anything. He uses probably half a dozen tricks to power up his monsters, depower and destroy the sacred beasts, and protect his life points. And every single trick works flawlessly, but Kagemaru is unfettered. He continually brings back Haman and Uriah, then follows it up by sacrificing three sacred beasts tokens to summon the third of it, these three big boys, Ravael. Lord of Phantasms. But all isn't lost. Jane responds by bringing out his ace, the Flame Wingman, then follows up by using the card he'd gotten from Banner's journal at the start of the duel to bring out Fusion Recovery and use it to upgrade the Flame Wingman to the Shining Flare Wingman, the same monster Jane beat Camula with, and for good reason. Shining Flare Wingman has the same special ability as the original Flame Wingman, but with the added bonus that he gains 300 attack points for every elemental hero in Jane's graveyard. That's 7. So, 300 times 7 is 2100. 2100 plus Shining Player Wingman's original 2500 attack points, and you've got yourself a monster with 4600 big ones. Jane then untargets Haman and blasts him to pieces, which has a damage total of a whopping 600 points. Jane only cost Kagemaru 600 life points thanks to Haman's special ability. Kagemaru only takes damage from the initial attack, not from the wingman's special effect. You didn't think it was going to be that easy, did you? You know, for a second there? Yeah, I kind of did. Jaden takes that L for now, and uses the effect of Banner's cardigan to set another spell card face down, and ends his turn. Kagemaru responds by going for another attack on the shiny monster with Ravael, but Jaden activates Diffusion to give himself two monster defenders, instead of one attacker. Kagemaru shrugs this off and blasts the OG Wingman with Ravael, and then blasts Sparkman with Uriah. But now, it's Jane's turn, and he uses the first effect of Banner's card one more time to bust out Miracle Fusion to fuse Clayman, Pristinatrix, Avian, and Bubbleman 
to create Electrum. And then he follows it up with the card's second effect, that being to boost him up by multiplying Electrum's current attack power by the number of monsters Kagemaru has on the field. So that's two Sacred Beasts and three Ravael tokens for a total of five monsters. Five times 2,900 is 14,500, which means Kagemaru is fucking screwed. Game over. They kind of make the ending a bit weird, though, with Kagemaru admitting that he really just wanted the power of the Sacred Beasts to be young again. But Jaden tries to encourage him to go ahead and just stand up on his own two feet. And Kagemaru, who was living in a jar before this, actually manages to do so to his immense joy. Jaden then gives the old man a great big bear hug and accidentally breaks his back. Bear hugs and old people don't go so well together. The strangeness of the ending aside, though, this batch of episodes was fucking great. 8 out of 10 for this two-parter, but probably more like a 6.5 for the whole arc. The little prequel to this arc was rough, but when things finally got going, hot damn did they get going. But when we got the filler episodes on that damn Tanya two-parter, oh. Hang in there, Squidward. It's all part of the job. I'm really glad I got to watch these episodes, even if things were a bit shaky in the middle because of the banger last two episodes and the Night Shroud and Camula episodes, but there's a whole lot of chap among all this wheat. Aside from the Tanya episodes, I didn't really hate anything, but I really would have preferred more focus on the main story here instead of just hitting the pause button at random intervals. If you tossed the really mediocre pirate episode and the completely fucking worthless Pierre episode, I could probably bump this up to 7.5 instead, but as it stands, yeah, 6.5 feels about right. Oh, and before we move on, a quick aside, if you're wondering where the frick these sacred beasts even came from, and why they look kind of like the Egyptian god cards, there's no canon explanation, but there's a fan theory from a fella called Spell Commander 91 If you're watching this video, you might already know about him, but if not, give this guy's video a watch because it's pretty darn neat. It essentially outlines that the sacred beasts might actually be a Hebrew counterpart to the Egyptian gods, which I actually quite like. Okay, on with the show now. Whew. So with all that sorted out, let's back to school life since we need a breather between all that chaos and the big exciting thing that comes next. So we're going to do something we haven't done in a long while, and that's do a Chumley episode. You see, it turns out that Chumley is a pretty badass painter, and during an art class, which Duel Academy has for some reason, Chum Lee actually made a gorgeous painting of the Uluru Rock in Australia. And it was so damn good that the teachers see it and send it to freaking Max Pegasus, who in turn offers him a job as a card designer. Chum Lee is all for it, but the crowd is less than enthused about the idea, seeing as Chum Lee is a pretty poor student, so he offers him a challenge. Duel, one last match against me as a final exam. If you pass, you graduate and get your dream job. If you fail, you're expelled and you'll hit the unemployment line. So Chumley pulls out all the stops and plays the duel of his life. He loses. But it's okay because Crowler says the exam wasn't conditional on Chumley winning, just on how well he played. And Chumley played a damn great duel. So he's gone from being held back twice to graduating a year early and getting a sweet ass job at Industrial Illusions. Awesome! 7.5 out of 10. A lovely little episode and a nice breather after all the chaos with the Shadow Riders. A nice little heartwarming story. Alright, enough of this gooey sh show of emotion. Alright, everyone, let's dig in! Well, looks like Chum Lee ain't the only one graduating this week. Zane is ready to enter the realm of the professionals, and he's ready to say goodbye to Duel Academy with one last matchup against the one person he thinks can fill his shoes when he leaves. And if you said Chaz, Bastion, or Alexis, you'd be close, but you'd also be wrong. It's Jaden. Because, of course, it's fucking Jaden. And after all that he's been through, and knowing how badly Zane crushed him last time, Jaden decides to go for a more scientific approach to dueling, but it ends up backfiring on him really hard. He's barely hanging on because he's not trusting his instincts and just having fun like he normally would, up until about midway through the match when he realizes two things. One, he's fucking starving! And two, he's been dueling like an idiot, and it's time to properly 
get his game on. The duel finally concludes with Zane summoning his Cyber End Dragon with Power Bond, thus doubling its original attack points to 8,000, and then doubling it again with the effect of limiter removal. He then opens fire on Jaden's Shining Flare Wingman, but Jaden activates the spell card Battle Fusion, which adds Cyber End Dragon's 1,600 attack points to the Wingman's current total of 4,900 giving him a whopping total of 20,900. Zane is amused by this, and then activates his own Battle Fusion spell, boosting his dragon's attack all the way to fucking 36,900 points. But before the attack connects, Zane gives Jaden a little speech saying that the Yuki boy will be his successor. He might be a sniper slacker, but in his book, He's the big man on campus now. Jaden, in turn, resolves to follow his example going forward. Starting right now because he's activating a trap. The awesome power of Final Fusion. What does it do, you might wonder? Eh, it just means that both players take equal damage to the combined attack power of both monsters. That's nothing. That's like... 57,800 attack points directed at a guy with... 550 life points and a guy with 100 even. Holy shoot! The duel then ends in a draw with both young men complimenting each other on a well-fought duel, and then they both collapse onto the floor, completely exhausted from such a hard-hitting matchup. 9 out of 10. An amazing pair of episodes, and it's exactly what I want from this series. Jaden proving himself again and again. Not by dueling random-ass scrubs with bizarre gimmicks, but by going against genuinely tough customers and succeeding against insurmountable odds. And by that same token, I like that the writers had the balls to say, oh, the kid who wins all the time? Yeah, we're ending this first season in a draw. He's not beating this guy. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> season one of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX is not a perfect show. It's packed to the brim with filler, and even as someone who enjoys a lot of how stupid this show can get sometimes, it gets to be a bit too stupid other times. The amount of filler is also a bit surprising given the fact that these writers did not have a manga to go off of. They could have done anything they wanted, but they instead felt the need to just spin their wheels for 26 episodes, and then finally have an actual seasonal arc in the second half of the show. But then they keep stopping and starting the arc the whole damn time. In the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series, there was no stopping and starting. When the gang was in Duelist Kingdom, they were in Duelist Kingdom. They didn't screw around for an episode or two, going off the island to duel some schmuck who talks like John Travolta in Pulp Fiction. When Joey and Yugi were in the Battle City Tournament, everything came back to that tournament and the Egyptian God Cards. There wasn't any exhibition duels where Yugi dueled some weirdo who had nothing to do with Merrick and just wanted to duel Yugi because they wanted Yugi to join their tournament instead. Focus was on the gods, on the people who had them, and the people who wanted them, nothing else. I guess this is maybe the advantage of having two main characters instead of just one. You can divide the focus. You had the stuff with the big dramatic stakes with Yugi duels, and then you had the stuff with the more personal stakes in Joey's duels. In Duel's Kingdom, Yugi had to duel to save his grandfather's soul, Kaiba had to duel to save his company and rescue his little brother, and Joey just wanted to win a shitload of money so he could get his sister the life-saving eye operation she needed. In Battle City, Yugi wanted to get all three Egyptian god cards, so we could save the world. Kaiba wanted them so we could rule the dueling world specifically. And Joey didn't care anything about the god cards themselves. He just wanted to help his friend save the world and prove that he was a true duelist. You have characters who could have given you that diversity in goals and mentalities, but instead, you mostly just had Jaden, who I love, but I really would have preferred some more time with the other characters. We saw Chaz duel from start to finish six times. We saw Alexis duel from start to finish four times. We saw Zane duel from start to finish three times. Same with Bastion. Same with Crowler. We saw Chumley only duel twice. Same with Cyrus. And I'm not even sure if we could count his practice duel against Jaden. And we only saw Professor Banner duel once when he was posing as Amnail. It's kind of a waste to have a whole series set at a school where the entire goddamn point is learning how to be a great duelist, and we only had 14 out of 52 episodes where the episode didn't focus on Jaden dueling, because Jaden doesn't need to learn anything. And actually, I'd like to pick on the Crowler thing a little bit too. 
We know Crawler doesn't like Jaden. He spent every other episode trying to get him spelled, but I really think it was a missed opportunity for Crawler not to develop a respect for Jaden going forward after Jaden cheered him on during his duel with Camula. Save your teacher because obviously he can't save himself. Wrong! Huh? Dr. Crawler can win this duel! Huh? I know that voice! It's Slacker! I know because I've dueled him! Believe me! He can throw down! And he'll find a way to beat you! So get up, Dr. Crowler, and get your game on! Imagine how sweet it would be if instead of a filler about Jaden dueling a sea pirate, we had an episode where Crowler and Jaden got to talk a bit. And Crowler basically explained why he cared so much about academics and offered to tutor Jaden since he knows he doesn't care about dueling from a school point of view. Just have him throw his hands up in the air and say, Look, kid, if you're going to stick around, then let's figure out how to get these grades up because I cannot bear to look at a single F on these assignments when I know you can do better. He said at the end of the first episode with Camula that the reason he was so harsh on everyone is because he believed in his students and their ability to be their best selves. So maybe after saying this, start an arc where he decides to turn these Slifer Slackers into Slifer Savants. There's a lot of missed opportunities with all these characters, but I think that especially there with Crowler. You have the ability to make him more than the mean teacher archetype, but then you squander that opportunity by just keeping him an asshole. That all said, this show is really fun and I am so glad to have watched it. For as stupid as some of these duels are, there's still so much fun to watch. All these little gremlins who were one-off villains of the week, Belowski, the Tarzan wannabe, the little guy who has stage bright but kicks ass, along with his ginormous friend, the tennis jock from an 80s high school comedy, the goddamn dueling monkey. They were all so wonderful. And when we got into more serious duels like the Jinzo duel or the duels with Night Shroud, Camula, Anmail, and Kagemaru, oh, these guys know exactly how to play it when they flip the switch. The first season is nowhere near as good as Yu-Gi-Oh's first season, but when it hits, Oh, hot damn, does it hit. So, in the final calculation, I'm going to give the first season of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX a 7.5 out of 10. A really solid start, but with lots of room for improvement. Whew. Oh, Lord Jesus. I wasn't sure if this is going to be another big boy video or not, but judging by the fact that I'm looking at 21 pages right now, yep. This one's another big boy. Thank you for watching, I really hope you enjoyed this. If this is your first time here, welcome. Please check out my other two Yu-Gi-Oh! videos. I talked a bit about Jaden and also Yusei in my review for the three Yu-Gi-Oh! movies. I talked all about Yugi, Joey, and Kaiba in my fuck-off-sized video about the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series. If you're a returning viewer who saw those two videos but didn't feel like subscribing, welcome back. I hope the third time is the charm. And if you're a subscriber who's loving all this Yu-Gi-Oh! stuff, well, you can look forward to even more because I'm going to be making videos discussing seasons two and three of this series down the line. Plus a video that I thought I wasn't going to make after all, but, uh, I've changed my mind. You'll have noticed the multitude of wrestling references in both this and my first two Yu-Gi-Oh! videos. And now I'm going to be making a video talking about just professional wrestling. Specifically, I'll be doing a retrospective come February on the reigns of every single Black World Champion in WWE history. From WWE Champion The Rock to current NXT Champion Carmelo Hayes. And you know what else? I've been on a bit of an MHA kick lately, and since Horikoshi looks to be wrapping up the manga pretty soon, I might take a minute to talk about some more anime. My first Yu-Gi-Oh! video is still doing pretty crazy numbers, and my second isn't doing too bad either. Maybe there's some gold in these Japanese hills. On the American front, I had plans to make a video discussing every Suicide Squad movie, but I'm putting that on the back burner for a little bit. I wanted to ride the wave of interest from the Suicide Squad game, but that got hit with yet another delay, so I'll just wait a bit on that. I have, however, recently made a video discussing the MCU's Phase 1, along with a couple of other list videos involving pro wrestling. You can find all of those right here, but in the meantime, check out some of my playlists. I put up reviews for other things, uh, Star Wars, the Predator series, so many freaking comic book movies, and lots of other cool stuff. Check it all out, and I'll see you guys when I post the next MCU video. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share the video with your friends. Woodstock, out! Thank mm -hmm. you.